Okay. We are indeed in the beginning of Advent. Advent, as we've been talking about, is a season of <clears throat> preparing, preparing uh, our hearts. We, the, the Christmas hymn that we sing, let every heart prepare him room. That's the goal of, of Advent, not just to prepare our homes with decorations, not just to prepare for family coming over, but to prepare spiritually. Let every heart prepare him room. And so to take intentional time over these weeks leading up to Christmas uh, to reflect on why did the Son of God come into the world. And so we uh, like to do series during Advent, and this Advent series is called The Mothers of Jesus. The mothers of Jesus. That might sound a little strange to you. You think, I thought Jesus just had one mother. Well, what that's referring to is in Matthew's genealogy, as we're going to see, uh, in, in Jewish genealogies, usually you would only include the, the men of that genealogy, uh, the, of who descended uh, down over time. But in Matthew's genealogy, he includes, actually includes women. It was shocking at that time that women would be included in a genealogy, and in, in the Messiah's genealogy, uh, and in, in particular, uh, the, the, the women who Matthew chose. You know, if you were writing a genealogy for Jesus at that time, uh, you probably would have chosen the, uh, the four model patriarchs of the Jewish uh, history. You, you would have chosen uh, Rebecca and Rachel and uh, Leah and Sarah. Those would have been your choices, but Matthew chooses uh, different women than those. Uh, In fact, one one commentator says this, he says, you know, one gets the impression that Matthew poured over his Old Testament, uh, looking, he poured over it until he could find the most questionable examples possible in order to insert them into his record and preach the gospel even from his genealogy. So Matthew is intentional with the the choices he makes, and the women that he includes uh, in his genealogy. So we're going to look at that this morning uh, in Matthew chapter 1. So if you're willing and able, would you please stand for God's reading of God's Word? Matthew chapter 1, I'll read the first six verses and then verse 16. We'll hear God's Word for you this morning. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amminadab, Amminadab, the father of Nation, Nation, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And then skipping down to verse 16, all the way through the Old Testament and into the New. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. May God add his blessing to the reading and now the preaching of his word. You may be seated, please. So... I think that this is going to be the last year. I think this will be the last year for our oldest child. I think we're finally going to have to tell her the truth about Christmas. You know, uh, Santa and reindeer and sleighs and toys, strip them all away, and what's left? What are we celebrating anyway? I was, I was talking with someone a couple weeks ago, just kind of chatting, and uh, they were telling me about their, their oldest kid, something that had happened in their life, and, and uh, 
she said, yeah, well, I, you know, I told her that everything happens for a reason. And, uh, and, and I said, well, what is the reason? And, and she said, what? I said, you said everything happens for a reason. I said, what is the reason that everything happens? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> no one's ever asked me that. It's just something I say. It, and, it, and we do the same with Christmas. Like, what is the meaning of Christmas? What is it all about? What is it all about? Is there any deep meaning to Christmas underneath the superficial? Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus, but does it have teeth? Does it apply to our actual needs? The truth is, we don't need a feel-good month. We don't need a season of distraction. We don't need um, those things. We need hope for our brokenness. We need light in our darkness. We need healing of our pain. We need salvation from our sin. So as we start Advent this season, I want to start by asking you, not do you believe in the Christmas story, but has it made a difference in your life? Not is it true, but, but is it, does it make a difference? There are five women, if you count Mary, five women listed in Matthew's genealogy, and their stories are there for a reason, that if you went through the compassion experience, you went through a story of someone. You went through the story of Jonathan, or you went through the story of, of Kiwi, and you, you walked in their shoes, and you, you learned something that was intentional why their stories were chosen. In the same way, Matthew, he wants us to walk through the stories of these women. He wants us to to, to be in their shoes and to, to ask, why are these here? Why are they included in Jesus' genealogy? It's not by accident. They're there to communicate something specific, a specific truth about why the Son of God was born into our world. So this morning, we're going to look at the first two mothers of Jesus that, that Matthew lists, Tamar and Rahab. And here's the big point of the sermon— Right up front, if you don't write anything else on your sermon uh, uh, notes, write this. The inclusion of Tamar and Rahab in Jesus' family tree teaches us that Jesus came to bring hope and healing to the sexually broken. The Son of God was born into the world to bring hope and healing to those who are broken sexually. And who, who does that include? Everyone. It includes everyone. It includes all of us. It includes me. It includes you. There, there is no part of us that is not tainted and affected by sin. Our minds, our, our emotions, our affections, and our sexuality. All of us are not whole. But joy to the world. The Lord has come to bring hope and healing to the sexually broken. What if you put that on your family Christmas card this year? (laughs) I think that would be great. Um, So who were Tamar and Rahab? Tamar's story is found in Genesis 38. It's one of those chapters of the Bible that preachers like to skip over because it's so raw, but it's in there, Um, and we shouldn't shy away from it. You can read it for yourself later on, but let me give you just the summary. Matthew, you remember, begins his genealogy with, with the patriarch Abraham, and so we can trace the line. Abraham gave birth to Isaac, and Isaac uh, uh, Isaac, uh, then uh, his son was Jacob. And then Jacob had 12 sons. You, you might recognize that those 12 sons were the, the, the seed of the 12 tribes of Israel. You see the, the names there. You know one of them uh, off to the right, Joseph. The, the Genesis tracks his story for a long time of being sold into slavery by his brothers and, and uh, then eventually rising to the right hand of Pharaoh 
in Egypt. Uh, but Jacob had 12 sons, and one of those sons was Judah. And Judah, uh, as the story goes, uh, kind of leaves his 12 brothers and starts to live his life kind of the way he wants to. He, he decides that he's going to marry a, a Canaanite woman, which was something he shouldn't do. And uh, as a result of that marriage, he has three sons. Judah has Ur, Onan, and Shua. Those are his three sons that are born to him. And he decides that uh, he's going to, to find a wife for his eldest son. And so Judah finds a woman named Tamar. And Tamar is married to Ur. And the, all the Bible says is that Ur was a wicked man. And because he was a, an evil man, the Lord killed him. So now Tamar, having been married to Ur, now her husband is killed. Uh, now she's left a widow. And in, in that time, in that day, the, the law, the practice was that if you were married uh, and uh, your husband died, if your husband had a brother, that it was the brother's uh, responsibility to then uh, marry her and carry on the family line to give children uh, to that woman. So when, uh, when Ur died, uh, Onan became Tamar's husband. But Onan did not want to have children with Tamar. Onan did not want to, uh, to, uh, to, pat, to continue on his brother's line. And so uh, Onan uh, uh, essentially takes advantage of Tamar, takes advantage of her sexually uh, without impregnating her. Now, I'll let you read Genesis 38 to figure out how he does that. But he, he, he essentially uses her but refuses to give her a child. And because he does that, the Lord is angry with him and the Lord kills Onan. So now God has killed Ur. He has killed Onan. Tamar is a widow again. And Judah looks at the situation and says, um, uh, I don't think I want to give my third son to Tamar in marriage. Because look at what happened to the first two. And he essentially kind of blames Tamar. And, and, uh, and so he comes up with this plan and says, well, listen, my third son is too young, and so uh, Tamar, you go and live with your father and wait until he grows up, and when he grows up, then I will give him to you uh, as a husband. Uh, and so uh, she goes and lives with her father and waits, because as a woman in that uh, day and time, that was her hope, to not have children, was, was essentially a death sentence. Uh, and so she's waiting, and, um, but Judah had no intention of giving his youngest son to her because of what had happened to the first two. And so she realizes this, that when the time comes, he's now old enough, Judah has not given him to her. And so Tamar has to take things into her own hands. Uh, and Tamar knows her father-in-law pretty well and knows what he's like. And uh, she knows that he's going down to a, uh, that he's going down to a feast. And uh, on the way, to that feast, uh, Tamar uh, sits by the roadside. She puts a veil over her face and she dresses as a prostitute. And she knows that her father-in-law, that this is something that, that would draw his attention. He doesn't recognize that it's her. And so uh, he goes uh, to what he thinks is this prostitute and uh, attempts to solicit her and says, uh, uh, you know, I want to I want to come into you. And she says, well, what, what will you give me? And uh, he says, I will send you, uh, I'll, I'll give you a goat. But he didn't have a goat with him at the moment. And so she said, well, what will you give me that I know that you're going to do that? And he said, well, I'll, uh, what do you want? She said, give me your, your staff and your cord and your signet. It would have been like him giving her his driver's license and his credit card, right, as, as pledge. And uh, she takes that and uh, they uh, are together, and she becomes uh, pregnant from that encounter. Uh, again, Judah doesn't know that it's her. So uh, he goes on his way, and uh, he actually holds up his end of the deal. He sends a friend with a goat uh, to uh, go take to her. His friend goes to the area where she was and says, hey, where's the, 
the prostitute that sits by the roadside and the people say, there, there's no prostitute here. We, we don't know who you're talking about. And he looks around, he can't find him. He goes back to Judah and says, listen, I went, uh, they've never heard of a prostitute there. Uh, I, I couldn't find her. And Judah says, uh, okay, whatever, she can keep the stuff. Uh, and um, he thinks that's the end of the story. Three months later, it's told him, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, who's supposed to be waiting for his youngest son, uh, your daughter-in-law is pregnant by prostitution. And Judah becomes incensed and, uh, and has what he thinks is righteous anger and says, bring her out, let her be burned. And, uh, and Tamar comes forth and she says, okay, before that happens, um, just, I just want you to identify whose staff and cord and signet are these. That's the man who got me pregnant. To which Judah says, whoops, <laughs> right? Oh no. He realized, actually he says in the passage, he says, she is more righteous than I. So uh, you have uh, from that incestuous relation, uh, Tamar gives birth to twins to Perez and Zerah. And so, Judah, Perez, Zerah, and Tamar are in Jesus' family tree. What about Rahab? Rahab, uh, if you remember uh, the, the Israelite spies, uh, or the Israelites were coming into the promised land under Joshua, they were going to cross the Jordan River and enter, in. and so Joshua sends two spies into the city of Jericho. It's the first city that they're going to, to take over, and, uh, and he sends two spies to go check out the city and check out the land. And so the spies go to Jericho, this walled city, and they, uh, in order to, um, to, to escape detection, they go to a prostitute's house. Because that would be actually a safe place to go. Not, not anyone would look for spies there. They go to, it says, the house of Rahab. And Rahab receives the two spies, but word gets out that they're possibly there. And the king of Jericho comes, uh, sends messengers to Rahab and says, Hey, give up the two men who are in your house. We heard that they've come here. They've come to, de to destroy our city. And Rahab lies to the king of Jericho. She says, listen, the men came here, but I didn't know where they came from. And in fact, they left, they went out the gate. Uh, and, but, but if you chase after them, if you go quickly, maybe you'll catch up to them. She convinces the king and, and his messengers, and they go after the men, thinking that they left. Actually, she had hid them on her roof under some stalks of flax. And, and she goes up to the men and says, listen, uh, I know what's going on here. We've heard about how God has destroyed cities uh, ahead of us. And, and, and I know that the Lord, your God, he's the true God, the real God. And so would you remember me when, when you come uh, to take the city? Would you, would you spare me? Uh, and, uh, and, and the spies say, we will, we will remember you. And so uh, Rahab, they, she lives in the wall of the city. Uh, and so she lets the two spies down out the wall of the city, out her window with a, a scarlet cord. And the spies say to her, uh, when we return, hang this scarlet cord in the window and we will see it. And anyone in this house will be saved. If they're outside the house, they'll be destroyed. But anyone in this house marked by this cord um, will be saved. And sure enough, that's what happens. The Israelites come, Jericho is defeated, Rahab and those who are in her house are saved, and Rahab, the prostitute, is in Jesus's family tree. So what do we learn from these stories? What do we learn from the stories of Tamar and Rahab? You remember the big point of the sermon, Right? That Jesus came to bring hope and healing to the sexually broken. But what can we say specifically about that um, because of these women? First, sexual brokenness is complex. You know, a cursory reading of, of Tamar's story focuses just on her dressing like a prostitute and deceiving her father-in-law 
to get her uh, pregnant, focuses just on her incestuous act. But interestingly, um, the passage itself does not pass judgment on Tamar, does not demand that kind of verdict. Uh, that would be the quick thing, to, to, to judge her for her act, but the, the passage itself is actually silent on the issue. Sometimes in the Bible, it's made very explicit. The Bible is very clear about what it thinks about someone's actions and that they're wrong. But other times, the Bible uh, is silent because it's inviting you to consider, to consider the complexity of what's going on. In this case, to consider the complexity of Tamar's brokenness. You, you, you think of uh, Tamar's age. Tamar was probably, when she was given to Ur, uh, her first husband, she was probably a teenager. She would have been 15 years old, uh, as was the custom. Uh, and so uh, just at that young age, she's married, and then her husband is killed. Uh, he was a wicked man. And then the, the, the next husband she has takes advantage of her sexually. Uh, and then he's killed. And now she's left... Uh, all by herself. She's, she's cast out. She's, she's unfairly blamed by her father-in-law, and, and she walks around like Hester Prynne um, with uh, the letter on her chest that says that she's not welcome. She's left without a hope in a future. Is it any wonder that she did what she did? In large part, Tamar's problem was caused by the corruption and indifference and failure of the men in her life. So it is with our sexual brokenness. Often it begins at an early age, when we're young. Um, uh, School administrators are saying, uh, even in our own school, uh, that, you know, what used to be the case, that you'd, you'd be dealing with explicit things and uh, the like in middle school and high school has actually been flipped on its head that now in school it's, it's in the elementary years. It's fourth graders who are being exposed to, to things that are way beyond their, their years and that uh, um, schools are having to deal with. Often it begins at an early age because someone sinned against you because someone exposed you to something you shouldn't have seen or used language that you weren't ready to hear. Or maybe like Tamar, your trust was violated. Sexual abuse in many different forms is shockingly and sadly common. I've had friends, lifelong friends, you would never imagine that something like that was a part of their story. They would share, and you would, you would weep. The profound effect that all of this has on our sexuality and the choices that we make, it doesn't justify anything. It just means it's complex. Our first response to any kind of sexual sin shouldn't be to judge. It should be to mourn, to cry out to God for help. Not only the complexity of sexual brokenness, but, but we also learn of the deceptive nature of sexual sin from these women's stories. You know, all sin corrupts, but sexual sin in particular creates patterns of deception. Judah had patterns of deception in his life. Judah was one of those 12 brothers. Judah was one of the brothers that sold Joseph into slavery. And when you read the story of Joseph being thrown in the pit and then sold to traitors, uh, what you read is that there's, there's two, uh, two of the 12 brothers are named. One is Reuben. He's named because he spoke up and said, we shouldn't do this. The other brother who's named, who didn't speak up, who's kind of the ringleader of the group, was Judah. Judah leading his brothers to sell Joseph into slavery and then lie to their father, telling him that he was killed by a wild animal. Judah begins to lead a deceptive life, and it's ironic that in trying to deceive Tamar, 
Judah is himself deceived. You know, I've, I, uh, I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to go to Las Vegas. I've always wanted to see the Bellagio fountains. I've always wanted to see all the lights, to go to some shows. And yet every time I ask somebody who's been there, you know, what's it like? They always say, you have no idea. I mean, it is wicked. I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the evil and the, um, uh, the sexual nature of sin is right in your face. It's blatant. It's on, it's on billboards. It's, it's people walking past you. It's, it's people handing you explicit material as you walk by. You, you can't, you just can't even ignore it. And, uh, and yet, with all of that kind of in your face, what's the thing that's promised about Vegas? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? It's the deceptive nature of sexual sin. Darkness doesn't like the light, and sexual brokenness flourishes in secret. Adam and Eve, when, when they sinned, what did they do? They, they covered themselves, right? They hid, and that's what sexual sin makes us do. Others may be fooled for a time, but God is not fooled. You know, think about it. Why was Rahab so successful at lying to the king of Jericho, at convincing him that she didn't have the spies? Because she was a prostitute. Because she was used to lying. She was used to leading a deceptive life. She was good at it. And she convinced him. Um, which leads to the, to the third lesson, that despite both the complexity and the deception involved, in Rahab in particular, it's, it's fascinating that Rahab is praised by Scripture. She's praised for hiding the Jewish spies. In the story itself, but, but specifically in two places in the New Testament, look at Hebrews and James. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And in the same way, James says, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Rahab shows us that God can use the sexually broken. And he doesn't have to wait for them to clean up their act before he does. Rahab the prostitute. That's what she's, that's her name in scripture. That's what she's known as in Hebrews and James. How would you like that to be for all time, right, in the Bible, your sin, Rahab the prostitute. But it was Rahab the prostitute who was held up as an example of faith. You know, did, did Rahab continue to be a prostitute after Jericho fell? No. But do you see that change was the result of her faith, not the prerequisite for her faith? Change was the result of her faith, not the prerequisite for it. God didn't say to her, clean up your act, then I'll accept your faith. He accepted her faith as she was, as a prostitute, and then she began to live a new life because she was now a new creation. What I want you to see is that sexual brokenness and sin do not disqualify you for the kingdom of God. Sometimes we lead people to believe that in the church. That, that there's this special category of sexual sin called unredeemable. But brothers and sisters, Tamar and Rahab the prostitute are in Jesus' family tree. They're in the family of God. How can that be? How can it be? It's because of their Messiah. They had a Messiah, Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the long awaited for Messiah. He came to rescue his people from their sins. He came to rescue Tamar and Rahab and me and you. Romans 8 3 says that God sent his son in the likeness of human flesh, he sent him for sin. Jesus came to represent us, to be a part of us, to identify with us. 
and to save us. Hebrews 4 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He is he is able to sympathize with us. Look at the quote in the middle of your bulletin in the reflection section. Matthew's genealogy is a stark indication that God's plan is not always accomplished through pious people, but through passionate and thoroughly disreputable people. Jesus did not belong to the nice, clean world of middle-class respectability, but rather he belonged to a family of murderers, cheats, cowards, adulterers, and liars. He belonged to us and came to help us. No wonder he came to a bad end and gave us hope. Martin Luther said that God intended for the reader of Matthew's genealogy to say, look, Christ is the kind of person who's not ashamed of sinners. He even puts them in his family tree. Jesus stepped into the complex web of our sexual brokenness. He ate with prostitutes. He let a prostitute use her perfume and her hair, the tools of her trade, to give him worship. He showed grace to a woman who was notorious in her community for her many marriages and was cohabitating at the time with a man who was not her husband. Jesus came to bring hope and healing for the sexually broken. No matter what's been done to you, no matter what you've done, there is hope, there is forgiveness, there is healing in Christ. The deception involved in sexual brokenness can produce deep shame. But Hebrews 2.11 says Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. He's not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to have us in his family tree. Tony Campolo, the pastor, writer, he was in Hawaii in Honolulu one time and was up late at night and was trying to find a place to eat. I mean, this is early in the morning, like 2 o'clock, and uh, finally found down, kind of down an alley, found this uh, sleazy diner and went in and, I mean, it's a really greasy place, and, and uh, asked the guy behind the counter uh, for a donut and some coffee and, and, and sat there uh, eating it. And, and as he was sitting there, uh, a group of eight or nine uh, prostitutes came in, I mean, dressed the part and, and, and being boisterous and loud. There was a small place, and so they sat on both sides of him, and they were uh, sharing stories and, and, and using crude language, and he was kind of starting to become uncomfortable, and he, he just about got up to leave when he heard one woman next to him say, tomorrow is my birthday, I'll be 39. And one of the other women said to her, well, what do you want from us? I mean, what do, you want us to, what do you want, a cake? You want us to throw you a birthday party? I mean, come on. And, uh, and she said, well, don't, listen, don't be so mean. I'm just telling you. She said, the truth is I've never had a birthday party in my life. No one's ever thrown me a party or given me a cake. I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Uh, and so Tony waited for the women to, uh, to leave. And when they left, he he asked the, the, the guy behind the counter, his name was Harry, he, he said, hey, uh, do, do those women come here every night? And he said, yeah, they, they come here every night. He said, what about the woman who was sitting next to me? Uh, he said, yeah, her name's Agnes. She comes here every night. Uh, wh you know, why? What, what, what do you want to do? And, and Tony said, I want to throw her a birthday party. And uh, do you want to help me do that? And this kind of big, gruff guy um, called out to his wife in the back who was doing the cooking. He's like, honey, come out here. And so this guy wants to throw a birthday party for Agnes. And uh, she said, that sounds awesome. That's a I, we love that. And, uh, and so he said, listen, this is what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to come back tomorrow morning uh, at 2.30 uh, in the morning, and, uh, and, and we're going to decorate the place. And, uh, and Harry said, yeah, I'll take care of the cake. We'll have a cake for her. And so sure enough, Tony comes back the next uh, morning, 2.30, uh, 
brings uh, some paper decorations. He made, made a sign out of cardboard that said, Happy Birthday, Agnes, and they decorated the diner. And uh, the wife uh, of, the, of the cook, I guess, had gotten word out to, uh, to the rest of the community, and every prostitute in Honolulu was packed into the diner and wall to wall. And, and right on time, at 3.30, uh, Agnes and, and her friends walked in, and, and Tony was, was leading the surprise, and they all yelled, Happy Birthday! And here's what happened next, as Tony writes, he said, Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open, her legs seemed to buckle a bit. Her friend grabbed her arm to steady her. As she was led to sit on one of those stools along the counter, we all sang happy birthday to her. As we came to the end of our singing with happy birthday, dear Agnes, happy birthday to you, her eyes moistened. Then when the birthday cake with all the candles on it was carried out, she lost it and just openly cried. Harry gruffly mumbled, blow out the candles, Agnes. Come on, blow out the candles. If you don't blow out the candles, I'm gonna have to blow out the candles. And after an endless few seconds, he did. Then he handed her a knife and told her, cut the cake, Agnes. Yo, Agnes, we all want some cake. Agnes looked down at the cake. Then without taking her eyes off it, she slowly and softly said, look, Harry, is it all right with you if I, I mean, is it okay if I kind of, I mean, what I want to ask you is, is it okay if I keep the cake a little while? I mean, is it all right if, if we don't eat it right away? Harry shrugged and answered, sure, it's, it's okay if you want to keep the cake keep the cake. Take it home if you want to. Can I? She asked. Then looking at me, she said, I, I live just down the street a couple of doors. I want to take the cake home, okay? I'll, I'll be right back. Honest. She got off the stool, picked up the cake, and carrying it like it was the holy grail, walked slowly toward the door. As we all just stood there motionless, she left. When the door closed, there was a stunned silence in the place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray? <laughs> Looking back on it now, it seems more than strange to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning, but then it just felt like the right thing to do. I prayed for Agnes. I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When I finished Harry leaned over the counter, and with a trace of hostility in his voice, he said, Hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? In one of those moments when just the right words came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for whores at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Harry waited a moment and then almost sneered as he answered, No, you don't. There's no church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. Who wouldn't want to join a church like that? Who wouldn't want a Messiah who throws birthday parties for prostitutes? Who wouldn't want a Christmas with that kind of meaning? Joy to the world. Tamar and Rahab are in the family tree. Jesus came to bring hope and healing to the sexually broken. Let every heart prepare him room. Let's pray.